Great, thanks. All right, so a little bit about me, um, my background. I've been at Iowa State, University of Minnesota, and Purdue. I've been kind of circulating around the Big Ten. Um, but my background is in plant breeding and genetics and quantitative genetics and then phenomics. So currently, as I mentioned, I'm at Michigan State. I do research and teaching. My research centers on genetic mapping and genomic prediction for applied traits, high throughput phenotyping to increase efficiency, and innovation in modeling and prediction. My teaching is in transdisciplinary skill sets and communication. So I teach a plant breeding class, but I also teach um, frontiers in computational and plant biology, which I'll talk about later. But it's a hands-on project-based uh, course that's meant to be kind of real-world job prep for grad students. And then just in case you're interested, this is kind of how I split my time amongst different species. Um, what this looks like in the program is that we maintain lots and lots of field space. And sh I'm showing here my nursery primarily. So this is where we would do like controlled crosses and pollinations to establish our research germplasm. Um, we do that in the winter a little bit as well. And then we have a number of field locations where we do observation experiments. This is an offsite location on a farmer's field. So we have several fields on campus as well. Um, one of our projects, we're involved in this collaborative project called Genomes to Fields, uh, which is about 20 some different groups across the US and Canada, where we collaborate and we grow different, uh, we, where we grow subsets of the same germplasm and that all gets genotyped and then phenotyped in a similar fashion. And then those data sets get combined. So it gives us a lot more data to play with and we can measure things in Michigan and use that for, to predict other states. So these are some of the people in my group that are involved in this project. They've been painstakingly measuring thousands of plants, which is great, but it's also really slow. And so one of the things that we're focused on is how to make that faster. Um, so our big question is from a plant breeding and genetics perspective, we want to predict how a variety is going to perform to assess its usefulness. We can use genetics to predict the phenotype, that's genomic prediction, uh, but it doesn't perform that well when you go into new environments. We can use physiological modeling to model and simulate different environments, but then that relies on really tedious hand-measured parameterization. Um, so we're trying to acquire those phenotypes in other ways and then leverage those different approaches to be able to improve predictions. So one of the ways that we think about this is we think about if we want to know things about these composite traits, those are actually influenced by a whole lot of different, what we would call um, component traits. And some of those we can measure, some of those we can model, but our hope is that we can use some of these sensor technologies to actually get at some of these traits to be able to predict those end use traits. So I started at Michigan State in 2018 and around 2019, I was putting together a team of people that I'd been talking to and wanted to collaborate with. And this was a pitch that we gave to the university in order to get kind of the phenomics started at Michigan State. So we put together a group of kind of plant scientists and then a group of computer scientists and engineers. And we smashed all these people together. Uh, and the, the pitch was that we were gonna use different scales of platforms along with commercial sensors and then do really cool plant science with it. That was, that was the idea. And we actually were able to do that. And we created some offshoot teams. One of the first, one of the first things that we did was we got a, a drone unit that has LIDAR and hyperspectral on it. If you're not sure what those sensors are, come talk to me afterwards. I'll discuss it a little bit, but I don't have time to go in depth, um, but we collected lots and lots of data uh, that allowed us to do some pretty cool uh, work. One of the use cases that I'll, I'll mention here briefly is using LIDAR at different dates to predict plant traits. So one of our collaborators, Dan Morris, uh, built some convolutional neural networks to take voxel models from the plots and turn it into phenotypes. Uh, we also do a lot of work with the spectral data. So this is reflectance across different wavelengths of light. This is visible light, this is near infrared. And using the different reflectances from different, um, different varieties and measuring then different biochemical properties, we can use machine learning techniques to train and predict traits. So this is an example of just water content that he's showing that you can model. Uh, but he's doing that in a project to, to work on nutrient management in corn. Another large project in our lab is working on tar spot, which is a fungal disease in maize caused by Phthalocoromatis. And it's new as of to the US as of about 2015. So one of our big projects has been to find resistant varieties and start doing breeding work with that. Uh, but we're also then doing some phenomics. 
And here I'm showing an example of being able to collect data throughout the season and then relate that back to onset and severity with the idea that if you could identify the disease before it's really widely seen, it would enable more management options for the farmer. And this is just an example of why this is so important. Corn on September 7th should not be this brown and dead. Um, this is in fact all diseased and this part that has the most disease by this date a week later has lodged, which means it's fallen over. So this causes up to about a 40% yield loss. So it's a, an important disease to address. Other projects we're working on, I have a student working on multi-objective genomic mating optimization. So how do you pick what parents will make the best future progeny? Um, physiological impacts of nitrogen and biostimulants, functional genomics and modeling in both maize and sorghum, and then assessment and prediction of flavonoid content in both kernels and leaves and its relationship to tar spot as well. Um, I have a quote I wanted to share with you because I think that one of the things I'd like to push is that these sorts of soft skills are really important to keep in mind when we're training students. Um, this is a quote from Temple Grandin, and she says, the world needs different kinds of minds to work together. When different kinds of minds work together effectively, there can be great successes. They complement each other's skills. And I think finding common language with collaborators can take a lot of time, but it's always very well worth it. And then the last thing I'll plug is that we have a graduate program that's interfacing computational and plant sciences. It's called IMPACTS. The course I mentioned earlier is a course that's taught as part of this program and uh, the obligatory XKCD slide here. Um, so this person is saying, when a user takes a photo of the app, should check whether they're in a national park. She says, okay, sure, easy GIS, look up, give me a few hours. He says, and check whether the photo is of a bird. She says, I'll need a research team in five years. Um, so in computer science, it can be hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible. And that's part of what we address in this course is that we're getting different groups of students from computational sciences and plant sciences to work together to communicate and solve some of those problems, whether they're easy or hard. As a quick use case, I'll mention this. It was um, part of an initiative funded by the AG2PI, but we partnered with different uh, industry groups. And in this case, the students were asked with no image analysis expertise whatsoever. Um, so this was all new to them, but they were asked to kind of give a quantification of how much blank fill, which means areas of the cob where there's no kernels. And so they created thresholds that would find the area of the cobs and the area of just the kernels and then subtracted those to get that estimate. An example from just this past spring, we had some LIDAR data from a popcorn trial from Weaver Popcorn in Ohio. And then we also had some diseased versus healthy uh, potato. So these are potatoes with hyperspectral drone imagery. Um, but the reason I show this slide is because I wanna show where these students started off in these projects. So when they first gave me their initial progress reports, this is what the LIDAR looked like. Um, you're seeing point clouds of distance estimates. This is the sky, it's the infinite return. All the corn is down here, but they didn't know that because they hadn't worked with these data types before. Similarly, this is not what the spectra of a plant should be. They were getting um, reflectance from the soil. And so learning how to deal with these new data types has been really, really useful. And I think to go from this to this in a matter of weeks is like pretty cool. So this is some of my funding and thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, right, I know. Um, so uh, now we're going to be uh, moving on to Kishav. Uh, Kishav um, couldn't attend in person today, but um, he's going to be online. Uh, I think you are muted. Oh, I'm. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, I think you can share your screen now. Can you share your screen now? Uh, yes, I'm trying. Uh, no, it's not active. Like share uh, screen is not active. Really? Okay. Uh,
हेलो ओके जस्ट ए मिनट नो इज नॉट एक्टिव येट Can I try it? Yeah, can you try it? So, what is it telling you actually? Like, you can. Uh, it's not like like share uh, share yeah. screen tab is not active. It is freezed for at my end. Can you can you refresh it? Can you refresh your Chrome? Uh, just... Hello. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, I refresh like two times, but it's still the share the skin tab is not active. Okay. I on a Mac or Windows. I'm on uh, uh, Windows 10. Yeah, I tested before this. Yeah, it, it worked, was, right? It worked. Yeah, yeah, it was working and now it's not uh, it's look like freezed. Can you see anything at oh. my end now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have. It works. Uh okay. I'm not sure if you can hear the uh it worked before now it's not working. Um yes, so I want to share the entire screen and this share tab is is it seems to be freeze. So that's the reason I cannot share this. Understood. Let's have a refresh. Uh can you refresh it? It'll kick him out, right? So yeah, it will. He'll have to rejoin. Oh, it will kick you out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell him he needs to re do a hard refresh and rejoin. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I want to stick on this one. Why didn't I hit F5? So we'll just have him rejoin because I also look like his camera was gone. And that is the extent of my technical ability. Yeah. That's it, right there. And when he's done with it. So we are already like ten minutes. Fine. Yeah. That's okay. So what I would recommend doing then is having questions only be done online and request that the speakers go in and answer questions via the Q&A on the app. For those of you in the audience to get us back on schedule, we request add your questions to the Q&A either using Chrome or the app directly and the speaker can go ahead and answer the questions in the Q&A that way then, and then that will hopefully be able to get us back on the tech right now. Are you online now? No, I is, is still not working. It's the same. Can, can you do a hard refresh and rejoin? 
yeah i'm keep doing like joining from scratch and still uh, is it like that so if you can if you can't click on share not at all uh you cannot click on share or no i know i can uh, so i can click on the share but when it is going to the permission at that and it is showing like share and cancel that share is freezed so it's not allowing me to share anything oh he might have to update his um, browser permissions oh you might have to update your browser's permission can so how because, because can i we have tested already this before right yeah before. yeah we, we tested it before and it worked before and it's not working now. so how i need to do this update what you are saying the screen the share button will change uh Yeah, he has to click on what he wants to share. So, do you know? so yeah, can't can, can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Hi, so I just want to make sure that when you're clicking share, you're selecting exactly what it is that you'd like to share. It isn't just. Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. entire, is it a window, a Chrome tab? What is it that you're trying to share? So, entire screen. I'm trying to share entire screen. Can you click on even I click on Windows and Chrome tab, all is the same. Like this share along with this cancel. Cancel is active, but share is freezed. So I cannot do that. Right, you have to select which window you'd like to share, and then share will be. OK, yes. So OK. Can you can you see me in my screen now? No, I cannot. I think it will take oh, some time. Two yeah. seconds? Okay. Yes. OK, thank you. Yeah, that was the point I didn't catch. <laughs> Sorry for that. So, can I run my presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining my presentation. Today, I will be talking about digital imaging technology in plant phenotyping in perennial crops perspective. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my research collaboration group from the University of Saskatchewan and Agriculture Agri-Food Canada and the University of Lethbridge along with all the funding agencies listed here. Here is an overview of my presentation. I have structured it into different points. First is the Canadian farm industry challenges, strategies of high throughput plant phenotyping, what is hyperspectral imaging, UAB setup for hyperspectral imaging, digital imaging data integration analysis workflow, and UAB selectivity studies are canola seed pod maturity, nitrogen use efficiency in canola, spring wheat yield estimation, wheat stripers assessment, and lentil desiccation response. Here, I want to address some of the key challenges to Canadian agriculture and breeding program. First is the crop adaptation to different environment and ever-changing climate, frost damage, heat waves, hailstorm, prolonged weather, drought, and salinity. For pest disease and the weeds, the farmer have to spray the crops with different chemicals, which increase the cost of the production and poisonous in the biosphere. To improve conventional crop management practices, as the tradition scouting is subjective, time consuming and labor intensive. So we need to find an efficient way to combine genome, phenome, environment and management in prediction of the key physiological traits. For some of the Western Canadian crop specific issues are in canola. Canola is one of the have the big impact in Canadian agriculture. The physical issues are the swathing stage, pod, shatter and oil seed quality. And some of the disease are club root, estrotenia, steam rot and the frost damage. Wheat is one of the widely cultivated staple crop, having some physical issues like stay green potential and yield estimation. And disease is the type of FHB and the leaf um, spot. And lentil is a, one of the biggest plant-based protein, having physical issues like prod, um, maturity, selection of the ideal desiccant and spray timing, and having series of different uh, disease associated with the lentil crop. So hence, we need to reduce certain chemicals like pesticide and herbicide from the human food chain. So why we need high throughput plant phenotyping? As we know, the conventional crop scouting techniques are usually time consuming, labor intensive, destructive and expensive. Also, uh, there is a global market demand on automatic selection of more adaptable crop varieties, ever changing climate. Also, there is a lack of adequate phenomics data in plant breeding program. So the hypothesis set is non-destructive analyze plant phenotypes in an efficient and rapid way. Hence, the high throughput plant phenotyping can address all these points while leveraging digital imaging to link phenomics to genomics, which is the genomics selection. Here is a list of all relative information using digital phenotype. 
First is germination rate, which is the seedling emergence or the plant count, and the photosynthesis activity, which is the stomata, nutrients, and different pigments concentration. Monitoring the plant growths, such as height, canopy cover, and the volume, drought, heat, frost, or cold tolerance, which is water or CO2 stress, and also identification of plant uh, pathogens quantification, early identification of pests or diseases. Also mapping of the crops to get the information of biomass yield and grain quality. These are the strategies for crop genetic gains set by Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Center at the University of Saskatchewan. So they are working in four different themes. First is immobilizing root soil microbiome interaction. Second is genomic and physiological selection of yield stability field phenomics for breeding and precision agronomy. And last is deep learning for phenomics using the artificial intelligence based tools. Hence, there is a sensor based uh, advances at different scale. First is a greenhouse based automatic control phenotyping, a ground based field phenotyping using proximal sensing, zone based field phenotyping, which is the aerial based systems. And last is satellite based crop health and precision management. So there is a light breeding germplasm and new genetic diversity after integrating all these different themes one can achieve precision agriculture deep plant phenomics and and climate resilient crops which gives the way of data revolution in agriculture sustainability the hyperspectral imaging is the combination of spectroscopy and imaging from a distance generally the hyperspectral camera collects all the subtle information in hundreds of waveband as shown up here so this is the hyperspectral cube having x and y as a spatial axis and lambda as a spectral axis you can see the single plot hypercube so the basic difference between multi and hyperspectral is the multispectral sensor generally collects information in a discrete manner and kind of hyperspectral collects all the information in a continuous way. This is a UAV setup for hyperspectral imaging in field. You can see a conning micro HSI SARC hyperspectral camera of a spectral range between 400 to 1000 nanometer and number of band of 150. Spectral resolution 2 to 4 nanometer with a special resolution of 1 centimeter at the height of 15 meter. Here we are also using a weather station and a spectral radiometer for the regular calibration of weather and radiance data. In the first case study, we have worked with canola seed pod maturity using UAV-based hyperspectral imaging. This study was done in summer 2018. 56 genotypes of the canola was planted by AFC in AFC farm in Saskatoon. For this study, five commercially grade genotype were selected, which were NAM 0, 13, 17, 48, and 76. UV data were collected at five phenological stages along the seed color change of 0%, 25, 40, 60, and 75%. Using on the UV fly day, we have collected the plant for calculating the pod and seed moisture manually. Using the hyperspectral imagery data, we have deployed canola pod maturity index, which is the function of blue, red age, and near infrared band. So we have plotted the pod moisture versus the canola pod maturity index and found a good square relationship of greater than 80%. Here, the, when the pod moisture is less than 30% and the, and the index value is less than 0.1, this gives an indication of canola swathing or ideal time of the harvesting to the farmers. And we have, uh, we have also found as an index change attributed to the moisture and seed color chain, it helped the breeders to make selection of the genotype based on the maturity and also determine proper timing of the spraying of the death again. This study is recently published in the Canadian Journal of Remote Sensing. Uh, in combination of previous case study, some portion of the trial were used to estimate nitrogen use efficiency among canola genotypes. Four varieties, including NAM and hybrid genotypes, were seeded in Canadian Research Farm in Saskatoon in summer 2018. Four nitrogen doses were applied in the soil. Here, we can see how the nitrogen fertilizer flows from the soil to the plant and in the atmosphere. The UV hyperspectral data were collected at different time points to measure the treatment effect. This is an average reflectant profile per plot from different nitrogen treatment. The nitrogen reflected index were used to classify the field imagery data to identify different doses effect on canola genotypes. The overall study could help the growers to gauge how much nitrogen they should be applying per acre to optimize the final grain yield. 
In the second case study, we have developed a spring wheat yield prediction model using UAV based hyperspectral imaging. This study was done in summer 2019. 15 spring wheat variety was seeded in Kandin farm in Saskatoon. Here you can see the hypers retrieve hyperspectral refractant profile of all the 15 spring wheat varieties at the flowering stage. The UV data were collected at the five uh, main stages, which was jointing, booting, heading, flowering, and ripening stage. Along with this, five uh, UV flights, we have collected the ground sampling data of the leaf chlorophyll, head moisture, and the final uh, final yield. The partial least square display analysis were used to classify the 15 spring wheat varieties. The, we have chosen the four machine learning algorithm, which was artificial neural network, partial least square, support vector machine, and random forest to train the high perspectival data with respect to the ground rating, which was leaf chlorophyll, moisture, and the yield. And we could able to make a yield prediction model using the different uh, machine learning algorithm at the different weight of, of different stages. Hence, we have found the partial least square diffusion analysis is a promising tool for wheat varietal discrimination. The overall result provide a better band selection methods. The maximum weightage was re retrieved by artificial neural network, which is 60 to 100 percent. And the flowering stage got the maximum weightage of 0.5 for, for yield prediction at R square of 82 percent. The third case study was about the wheat stripers assessment using UAV based hyperspectral imaging. This study was done with Professor Randy's group in the wheat stripe nursery in Saskatoon. We have started with four checks from resistant, moderate, resistant, moderate, susceptible to susceptible. So average reflectant profile of all the checks were plotted with respect to the uh, with respect to the wavelength and we have used the first order derivative to identify all the prominent changes in the wave bands. So on the basis of those prominent change wave bands, we have identified the main uh, vegetation indices and those vegetation indices value were plotted with the ground truth rating of average severity. And we have found that leaf, this uh, disease severity index is giving the maximum R square value of 0.90 as compared to the other index. In this project, eight herbicide treatment responses in lentil desiccation were studies for the experimental design a small red landed variety CTC Maxima was seeded. Eight herbicide treatment listed here were studies for the ground rating, visual desiccation, and lentils uh, plant moisture content were measured. The UV data were collected at five different data points after the treatment, including the baseline. The partial least square data point of all the different herbicide treatment were plotted to measure how they move from their control. The equilibrium distance from the control were plotted along with the different treatment and date after the treatment. As a outcome, the equilibrium shows a comparative herbicide response in dry down of the lentil faster. Ammonium nitrate has the most quicker effect from three to 24 days after the treatment. Glyphosate effect starts slowly and attain the highest up to the end after the treatment. And, more, uh, and the maturity index observed as a surrogate of equilibrium distance. The main key development from all these studies are UV based high specific imaging has potential in early detection of physiological stresses like pest infestation disease in different cultivars. Maturity index can be used to dis decide ideal swathing or harvest st stage in rap seed genotypes and to make better seed selection. Digital imaging technology can be used to enhance nitrogen efficiency and colonial genotypes to optimize the final grain yield. Machine learning approaches has the potential in serial type discrimination, band selection, and yield estimation. Spectral imaging are used to study disease response in lentils to improve pre-harvested herbicide applications. Thank you everyone for your time. Have a good day and let me know if you have any question. We'll have the uh, questions uh, after the after the next talk for the Q and A. Now um, we're going to have Gigi from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, yeah. So that's probably mean that I have thirty minutes to finish my talk. That was a joke. <laughs> so um, while. Well, uh, uh, yeah. Kapulit is, is uh, firing my slide, and what I'm going to do is I just introduce myself a little bit. Um, what I'm going to talk about is quite different from my two colleagues earlier, and I'm going to talk about a perspective from the livestock sector. Um, so my name is Yijie, and then my uh, pet 
Um, I joined the, the part, I joined the faculty position courageously since 2020 August. So probably right now, like my lab and then my um, achievement is probably not as much as my colleague share, but because I only have two students and three other people, me, myself, and I. Uh, but hopefully that group will, will grow eventually. Okay, so my focus area is precision livestock management. I'm really glad to see Dr. Hosa is sitting in the in the audience and can back me up. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to talk about is what is precision livestock management if uh, that is a, a either alternative, different, or new concept to you all. So, um, so let's just stop for two seconds and look at this. So this is a commercial and typical feedlot operation in Texas. And when we talk about technology and how we can use that te technology in operations like this, this is what we're uh, thriving for, at least what I'm working towards. So we wanted to uh, provide a tool for utilizing real time or probably near real time data on individual animals to aid the management decisions for producers. So you may see this cute little cow um, as an example, and there has been a lot of research done before uh, using either wearable sensors or attachable sensors. So right now I think the direction is driven to a little bit like remote sensor or contactless sensor. Uh, including a lot of these. I'm not going to go into depth. And uh, if you're interested, you can uh, uh, come and talk to me and discuss with me, Dr. Lee and Dr. Hosa later. So, but what we're targeting at is no matter what kind of input and data we can collect, we want to perform some sort of analysis, but our ultimate goal is always to try to help the decision-making for the management so that they can produce um, butter meat and uh, have butter yield and have butter production efficiency. So that is our goal. So really quick, um, what I'm going to do is just really quickly zipping through some of my ongoing research. So for example, uh, we I've heard a few people talk about IoT, Internet of Things. So that is something I started to play with um, right after I joined you now. So first off is we use a uh, LoRaWAN technology or LoRaWAN communication protocol, which is using a different communication package that can reduce the load and reduce the uh, data requirement for data transformation. So what we did is, um, what that means is you can have all sorts of sensor as long as you it has a LoRaWAN protocol and you can connect that to the internet and see it in real time, which is really uh, convenient. So for us, uh, we started with GPS sensor. So this is what we see in real time, uh, not in real time anymore when I have that screenshot that was real time. So that is our research feedlot um, and here, and we can have our sensors seeing like the location and in real time. So you may ask me like what that helped me in my research or in you know producer for producers. So this is what we're looking uh, going after. We can see one calf's activity for a week, which is absolutely different than 25 of them in a single day. So then what it can help me is it can help me identify their grazing density. So this is a density hot map. Um, so like, well, it's probably a cold map based on my color scheme is the bluer the color is, the more often to visit it. And please keep in mind, this is a really unique and ideal research plot. So you probably can't find a any more flatter, an animal like square, uh, no obstacle, like no trees you know, easily in, uh, in the United States. So even for such a small scale, we still have, you know, ununiformly grazed area. And what is driving that? How can we manage that resource more uh, efficiently? That's what we're looking after. So another um, application for such technology is virtual fencing. 
which is used also using uh, LoRaWAN technology. And so what we can do is to monitor our herd with a much bigger scale and uh, not only to understand what is driving their distribution, their grazing behavior, but also try to avoid overgrazing and also like um, understand their greenhouse gas contribution, which is a really hot topic and to uh, mitigate the climate change. Some other thing is actually also is probably knowing this from inside out is we're using alternative sensing to provide more information for us to use. So uh, there, I think Dr. Jose is going to, to speak into more detail about what is a depth camera. But the problem that is, that is directing me directing me for my research is I was shocked to know that a lot of the cow calf producers actually do not have the capacity or the tool to measure their beef cow body weight. So um, this is how a depth camera works, but what it provides is a third dimension, which is the depth, the distance from the camera to the any objective that you can see. Um, so we take this and then we have kind of like a mold and then we just have that volume uh, digged out from that image. And from that volume, what we can do is, this is a really preliminary data that we, I think is roughly 60 beef cattle. For anyone that don't know how much they will weigh is on average, a mature beef cow would weigh anywhere between 1100 to 1300 or even above pounds. Um, so I don't know about a lot of other application area, but for me, uh, from zero, uh, capability to like 5.4 percent error rate. I think that's a big, at least to me, to cow calf producers. That is a advantage uh, for potential application. So the challenge is how do we apply that in the field and also like at scale. Um, so that's still a very challenge because individual identification has been a key bottleneck bottleneck for. Uh, application for, for identifying individual animals. So it was Dr. Lee Guoming's help and we uh, use uh, the nose print for a uh, identification marker. And we were able to train, uh, test 59 deep learning models. And then the best model actually have really good performance and accuracy rate was about 98.3% if I didn't remember it incorrectly. Now, uh, the last part is because I wanted to uh, use the technology or any instrumentation that will be useful for the producers. So I think it's important for them to understand and also to understand what they need and what they think. So in my extension responsibility, we conducted a survey um, to understand the feedyard or feedlot producers understanding for knowledge in precision livestock management newer technology and their acceptance, um, their concerns, and some of the strategy that drive their uh, adoption uh, decision. So here is our result. And we have 78 surveys completed, and that covers more than uh, 574,000 cattle managed. Um, so here's, I only, I'm going, going to only show three highlight uh, uh, answers to two questions. So I think this tells us that precision livestock management or tools have a really bright future and application potential because uh, a lot of them are either somewhat familiar or not familiar. So there's a lot of room for us to deliver that information to them. Now, the second thing is how many of them are using uh, the technology or some sort of tools already? And um, only a very small portion says either already using or they're not going to touch it at all. So that's really promising feedback. Now, the key thing is how much they like to spend on such technology. The answer is they are only comfortable in spending less than $10 per head. 
So think about that. How much can we buy using five bucks or 10 bucks? That is the challenge um, for us to applying technology in the animal sector. Okay, so, and I think I uh, probably go over a few minutes, but thank you all for uh, the attention and uh, hopefully we still have a little bit of time for a panel discussion. Uh, thank you, and that was actually right on time. So now um, we're going to bring in uh, Noah Fogren. He's going to moderate the panel. Uh, hi, all. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll take that as a yes. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there. Uh, that was a really great uh, set of talks. And I think as you saw, um, you know, whether we're talking about animal or plant agriculture, um, the folks are collecting a lot of data and um, you can see the similarities and goals where, um, you know, we want to improve on in the field um, or on the farm decision making and uh, predictability. So um, I have some, we have some prepared questions for the panelists, but if you also have questions, then um, ask in the chat or in person, Camillo can interrupt to ask live questions. Um, but we just wanted to start, so broadly speaking, if uh, the panelists could tell us what they see are the biggest challenges uh, to the adoption of digital agriculture, you know, at scale. Some of this stuff is easier to do in the lab, but what do you see as the, the biggest things that prevent us from using these technologies you know, at scale? What do you want to start? Uh, can, you, can you start? Well, I'll start to answer that question, Noah. So I think for my application, uh, the, the biggest challenge that I can see is actually the cyber uh, infrastructure that because we're working with either plant crop or animals, they're kind of like all housed in rural areas and connectivity and internet is the bottleneck of their um, infrastructure. So I actually was troubleshooting one of our IoT device um, out at Research Farm, which is much better and much more uh, civil than rural places. But still like I was checking the cellular uh, connection and coverage that was really not a good spot. So if we wanted to overcome that um, and broaden the application for um, IoT or any sort of digital agriculture application, I think that, at least to me, that is the bottleneck and the biggest challenge uh, because that adds to the cost and then to a lot of planning and develop development. Yeah, so that's what uh, my observation is, is uh, reporting to me. That's a great answer. I would add to that. Um, so I, I was really encouraged to see your survey results, actually, because I think if you asked farmers that are farming like crops and corn and things about high throughput technologies, I think there'd be a little less buy-in and a little less interest. Because right now, either I, I believe the average age of farmers, at least in the US, is like 58. Um, and they're a really risk-averse group. So unless they really see a value, like a return on that investment in the very near term, it's not gonna be of interest. So I think identifying what are the most tangible best bets and saying like, this is gonna provide this much of a return. This is why you should invest this amount in it and it will help you in these ways. Until we're to that point, I don't think as many farmers are gonna be interested in the kind of exploratory phase of how will this help my farm? Some that I've spoken to that have tried out some sort of high throughput technologies, they'll say, well, I got all these really great pictures, like my, you know, my yield monitor or whatever shows me this map of my farm and it shows me that I have this low spot that's performing poorly, but I knew that. 
what am I supposed to do with this pretty picture? How do I actually implement that into a decision or a process or a, a thing that can be addressed? Yeah, exactly. I also agree with that. I think like this page is like for implementation, which kind of things we should be using as for the objectives. And the second one is the data management side of the things. So the technology first, when it comes to the mind of any farmers want to use or any research group want to use, that's the big question, like what kind of uh, like system they should be starting or using, what they are planning for. So the choice of the uh, like uh, choice of the technology, choice of the making the sensors, platform, choice of the softwares, and and what they will be will be doing after collecting the data, like big data from all these technology, is a big question is still because it's not well documented. There is a different scattering, uh, uh, like um, platform uh, is around the. You can see in the GitHub there is a lot of uh, codes are available. This is a different research um, groups they share their um, their methodology how they are. Uh, doing the processing side of the things, so that is uh, one of the technology implementation is a uh, is a bottleneck like how we are solving all those uh, hesitancy uh, while I started using the technology part. And the second phase is how we are doing the data management side of the things. So data is keep coming when we are collecting throughout the season, uh, throughout the year of different trials coming from the proximal sensing in the greenhouse or the or the ground based sensing or either using the flying the drones. So there is a data is coming. So how we are maintaining that data, what is the should be the right protocol so that it can be retrieved by someone which is not much, much familiar with the data type. And what is the pipeline as an input to the output scale to track the different phenotypes can be uh, possible from that data. So all these aspect of the data management is still uh, is very limited. Yeah, so, so that's the like, having the big issue in terms of uh, technology uses and data implementation. Um, and I guess, I guess on, maybe on the other side of things, opposite from producers, are you all able to recruit the people you need into your programs? Like, do you, do you have trouble getting computational folks to work on these projects? And if so, uh, how do you think we could improve that? Um, yeah, improve the ability to recruit them. This time, don't sit in the first seat. So that's <laughs> not okay. Um, I remember I uh, so I actually had a, a cheat sheet, and I remember like I wrote down all capital letter. It is so hard. <laughs> for that question, Noah, um, because I think we're not only dealing with a generation shift into uh, different like uh, interest and different uh, knowledge desire, but we're also dealing with a reduced workforce just in general, like uh, less and less young generation people are interested in agriculture just in general. So how do we increase uh, the possibility to recruit them? I think it's just like, like what we're all doing right now is expo increase the exposure of what we do and um, bring up the potential for multidisciplinary application and uh, uh, knowledge and gap learning. So for example, like for myself is, I learned a lot from my plant and crop colleagues. And as you can tell, a lot of the uh, technology and application side, they're way ahead of, at least in the big cattle sector. And that's all where I can learn from. And hopefully like our new generation can also like learn that uh, learn from it and hopefully that will be a good method for them to be interested in the area because I think like curiosity is always the primary drive for um, any kind of re recruitment that we can do. My short answer is not yet but I'm sure it's coming. Um, I do a lot of recruiting at the undergraduate stage across a lot of disciplines. And so I end up with students in my lab who are maybe pre-med or they're working on really, really different things. But because my lab promises the opportunity to do research and they don't necessarily get that in the clinical setting, it's especially pretty competitive. And so 
the chance to do something hands-on and do some research and be treated like almost a miniature graduate student, um, I think has been a big draw in my program. And that gets students at least kind of interested and involved and exposes them to agricultural problems. And it has been successful in some regards. Um, we still at this point get a lot of graduate student interest. Um, so that's been great. I'm gonna be really, really sad when that goes. I don't know, we'll see. Um, but the other thing I will say is that I spent a lot of time when I first started on campus, cold messaging random people across campus. Uh, Michigan State didn't have a lot of kind of phenomic stuff going on. And so I just approached people in the computer sciences that were working with machine learning algorithms or face detection for cell phone apps or you know anything that could have been remotely relevant and i said hey do you want to work on plants we have all these really cool problems that your algorithms could help address and a lot of them said yes there were one or two people that said no all my students go to work for google and i said okay that's fine uh, but it, it helps you identify you know excited collaborators that can make really good progress really quickly sometimes it just takes asking like hiring a right because uh, itself like uh, deep agriculture is a very interdisciplinary like it's coming from different like programming language and then engineering that come like computers science uh, from the programming and plus uh, those uh, theoretical knowledge of the remote sensing that's a big key here so when we decide to hire any like engineer then it's, it's never work on the agriculture field it's hard to understand why the person is is doing and what kind of the data protocol collection should be in place for him so the person need to be learned because of the this one like a field itself is very interdisciplinary because Mike uh, practically I found like uh, people have limited understanding of the calibration side of the things like what procedure they need to be follow especially when you are collecting the high perspective data there is a very concrete guidelines of the collecting the high perspective because each band is a very nanometer scale and it's coming in, like bringing a lot of uh, in depth or, in, or subtle information about the object. So those kind of uh, practices uh, need to be like comes from when the person started working in like coming from the engineer or computer science field to the agriculture, then uh, the person let uh, train himself uh, along the line. So that is a very hard part is to find a multidisciplinary kind of the person who can who can like do multiple jobs while working in the digital agriculture side. Any questions from the audience before I can ask another? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just go to the microphone and if you can sit, if you can speak uh, uh, closer. Yes. I have two questions, one for Eric and one for Timothy. And for Eric, you mentioned so the, the genomic selection uh, when you predict for new environments. Uh, you have GBI, I think when you were talking about the situation with GBI. So how this technology helps you making predictions for new environments? This I don't know if that's what you 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 thought you were meant to say. And then the question to uh, EG is when you look at you use GPS and to monitor the where animals are during the day and during the period of time. So do you distinguish if they are resting or if they are grazing? Because you may have a a hot spot but it's a resting area. Great questions. Okay, so you asked about G by E and how this helps us. So I've got a few answers for you, in fact. Um, one approach that you can take to improve predictions into another environment is to use environmental covariance. So you collect information about the weather um, and then you can use those to kind of make predictions. The difficult part to that is that you could have infinitely many environmental covariates. And you can also have varieties within each of those environments that are going to be at different stages of development at any given time. So that a drought on June 1st is going to impact a variety that is this big a lot differently than it's going to impact one that's this big, right? Um, so getting those covariates right is a challenge. And we're using a few different ways to address that. But one of the methods is through using uh, crop growth models. We are actually simulating the growth of a particular variety in a particular environment, and it sort of accumulates each day based on the, the growth stage of that plant and the environment that it's seen. Um, as I mentioned before, that the, the slow part there is that you have to have enough information to put into that, um, that model. So there, there's a 
we're trying a couple of different ways to do this. Uh, but the other answer I have for you is that it's possible. We've, we've done some comparisons using our LIDAR-based predictions between phenomic prediction and genomic prediction. And in a lot of cases, we get phenomic prediction early enough that you could be making breeding decisions without considering genetics at all. So if you can fly your site and estimate based on what you see in the growth up until the stage of, say, flowering, um, what its final characteristics are going to be, you could just use that as your, your information. Um, so I think a, a combination of phenomics and genomics is going to be super powerful. And um, there, there's probably infinitely many different statistical models you could use using covariates or fixed effects or something from each of those pieces of information. Like if you have a gene that you know is impacting a trait, you can include that in the model and then use the environment to predict out. But I, I think it's a very promising area and one where I've seen a lot of progress in recent years. And it's, it's exciting. So we'll see, we'll see where it goes. We can talk later if that didn't answer your question. And I think you're, you're absolutely right, Dr. Hosa. It's like that GPS alone or commercial IoT GPS would not tell me if um, the calf was grazing or it was resting. So what we would need would to have an accelerometer and add on to it. But unfortunately, right now, like the commercially available um, IoT or lower one devices won't, do not have like two that live in the same unit. So if we can customize some lower one that's absolutely doable, but take some time. So for example, the virtual fencing is an example. It is using uh, LoRaWAN GPS and add on some tracking and sound features to, to actually provide that virtual fence um, uh, similar to a dog, dog collar. So I think that there's a lot of potential we can do, but like you said, just having one mechanism or one measurement will have really limited information. Uh, any other quick questions? Uh, no, there is a question on the chat box. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, sure. E e e G, um, there was a quick question that asks, uh, do you use a front end for the IoT uh, LoRa WAN setup? Um, how do you analyze the data from the sensors downstream and do you use the cloud? started use um, some company developed uh, front end, which was, uh, let me put it this way, it has a compromise uh, pro and cons. So the pro is, you know, you don't have to code anything. It is ready for you to use as long as you might uh, mitig mitigate and migrate your sensors. But the downside is it might not be tailored for your application. So for example, the LoRaWAN technology and GPS alone, they were designed for fleet management. So we have a lot of information that we don't need to use, but we're paying for that. Um, as you could probably tell that, like uh, uh, most of these develop and uh, company develop front end, they would require a subscri subscription fee. So we eventually ended up uh, the blog our own, which is it takes some uh, computer science and internet uh, language, and luckily one of my students had. And but the the feature that you want would be actually a lot more simpler and is tailored absolutely just for your uh, application. So how do I analyze the data from the sensor downstream? So unfortunately, that is still done by uh, manually. Like when I say manual, even though there's some R code or Python code involved, but still we um, demand and determine what kind of, how the data we want to analyze. So we write the code and then like, hopefully that would ultimately analyze every day's data, every hour's data, uh, et cetera. Do I use the cloud at all? Yes. Um, so for the uh, now the customized front end and back end uh, lower end or IoT application, we needed to use cloud database. 
um, which, you know, like it will be a some minor fee, but a lot more affordable than a uh, company bill lock plan. Because if you only have four or five sensors, there are some really good free front end uh, solutions. But if you want to have 30 cattle, 50 cattle, and 100, and scaling up can be very expensive. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in expanding this discussion, Rodrigo, please reach out and I'm more than happy to discuss uh, this into details.